Uh, if you see your name up there, you could unmute yourself and start uh, describing your work. And I think the first guy is going to be um, Jim Mayer. Okay, this is a uh, urn for ashes. My brother, -in -law, uh, my wife's brother-in-law was a luthier. <clears throat> he died in uh, July. Uh, it was a good opportunity to see if I could actually make a complete urn. So that's the outside. The, the vessel is uh, maple. The top is uh, mahogany. And the uh, guitar up above is cherry. Let's go to the next picture. So how do you get threads if you don't have a threading device? Well, a trip to the hardware store, I got an inch and a half ring for conduit pipe for female threads, inch and a half PVC pipe for the male threads, and with a little bit of careful orientation, I glued both on with epoxy, and the lid fits just the way I wanted it to. The hollowing, it holds about <coughs> almost two pints, which is not enough for a full load of ashes, but the ashes were to be distributed amongst the number of the kids, so it, it had enough capacity uh, for what she wanted. And then the next slide is the bottom. That's very nice. Hey, Mike, go to the uh, show presentation full screen. Is that better? No. Pardon me? Pardon me? Oh, yeah. the top where it says slideshow. Yeah, I was clicking on that. Yeah, it's a little bit bigger. That's all I got. Now, it's, it's under the uh, show area. Um, there you go. Down there. Yeah, we're just seeing the regular PowerPoint, Mike. We're not actually seeing the slideshow itself. I don't know why it's not. Uh, it's showing that way on my screen. Um, go to share screen and pick, pick your desktop. Yeah. All right, hold on. How's that? There you go. Much better. There right. you go. I got it. All right. Very nice, Jim. Can Thank we go you. back? Can we go back? No, oh, it's frozen. Why is that? Up and down arrows. No, it's not working. Of course. There we go. What did you want to see? That's the. It's the top outside. There's the um, inside with a threading mechanism. There's the bottom. I would, liked, I would have liked brass for the the threading devices, but I couldn't find it. And this was probably the least expensive way to go. Yeah. And it's not going to rust. Looks nice. Thank okay. You. Okay, I um, made these at the uh, Jerry Messimer workshop uh, over at Ron's and they're spalted maple uh, with the walnut tops. Um, those are the uh, two of the three that I made and um, they're just plain wood at that point uh, with the uh, beads burned in. Uh, if you go to the next slide, it's the one that I painted with his uh, airbrush system and used the ink and the um, gilding on the top and bottom. Um, I've, I've started making a couple at home and found out that uh, uh, his technique of 
putting it in the chuck before without a uh, tenon. Um, you got to have a chuck big enough to grab the four sides of the two by two by five piece. Uh, otherwise, you got to make a tenon on it first to, to get it in. But those are the ones that I made at the uh, workshop uh, over at Ron's last uh, couple weeks ago. Okay. So how, how many minutes does it take? You take more than seven minutes that Jerry takes? Yeah, they, um, they actually go pretty quick, but he had the, the blanks uh, drilled out and uh, we just had to drill the ends and um, turn them down. But um, they, they do go really quick. They look nice. Thanks. Tom Lodge. I saw Tom, he's on. Tom Lodge, you need to unmute. There we go. We can't hear you, Tom. No, it's, it's, it's garbled, Tom. You're not, we're not coming through. Still not. Tom, you're still not coming through. Yeah. Tom, can you try another microphone? Much helium. <laughs> I was going to say he sounds like uh, Tom and Jerry or something. Yeah. yeah. Well, why don't we come back to him later? All right. Looks like Tom made some, uh, that's a pretty big, big shop. That's a pretty nice shop. And then um, here's some uh, more birdhouses. All right, we'll go to Nolan. Yeah, this uh, piece of red heart that uh, the kids have bought me. It's turned on seven axis. I turned a hexagon piece to start with, with six separate axis, and then obviously I turned it round and hollowed it out. Uh, again, as you can see, it's about four and a half in the diameter, about two and a half high. Uh, never worked with the redwood or red heart before, so, and it looks a little bit like the bloodwood. Yeah. What's your finish on this, Nolan? Uh, the finish on this is just a uh, shellac. I shellac most of my things. It's uh, simple and easy, and I have a jar of it handy. So, this was a big piece of box elder. It, actually, I picked it up at the uh, wood raffle sometime in the past. I don't know when. Uh, again, it's just a deep bowl. It's got a lot of good color and a few little, a uh, couple little pin knots showing this picture. Eight and a half in diameter, about three inches high. The uh, finish on this is a uh, lacquer because I didn't want to take away from any of the color. And this is a maple bowl. Uh, as you can see, it's about nine and a half in diameter. Again, I, this is another piece from the wood raffle. Uh, mm -hmm. like trying to dig into that big box of things back to have in the back of the shop. Uh, again, this is just a shellac finish and it's got some uh, neat little things as far as uh, a branch in at the top and a little uh, leftover bark on the bottom. And other than that, that's just a question. It's a simple maple bowl. Is that grooves in there? Uh, yeah, I, I got three uh, grooves. I, it's not really a signature, but I usually try to uh, put the three, the three grooves someplace on it too close together and and one separated. Usually it's in the bottom, but this time I, uh, I need a little something around it. So I put those in and then, uh, and then burn it with burn wire. Now this is a very nice shape. You got the shape, nailed that for sure. Well, how, how many coats of shellac do you put on something like that? Uh, I probably got two, maybe three coats. Depends a little bit of one on, uh, 
whether I'm trying to rush it or not, uh, and how and uh, how quick I, I get to it. Usually, I try to uh, put a coat on and uh, I let it sit there and spin while I clean up the shavings off the floor, and then I go back and get another coat, and then. Uh, Depending, I may pull it off the lathe after two coats or three coats. I may leave it on to the next day and go put another coat or two on it and then flip it around and take care of the bottom. Do you buff it? I'm sorry? Do you buff it? Do you actually this, smooth it uh, out a little? Yeah, this has not really been buffed. I was trying to think. The, uh, the box elder one, I did uh, buff and wax after I put the lacquer on. But this is just a shellac wood, and the only buffing is just uh, lightly with a uh, piece of cloth just to uh, take care of any dust that might have gotten in it. And just, that's about all there is to it, like I said. Okay. So um, the theme I have today is a honey locust burl. All the pieces I'm going to show today are from one tree. You guys probably might have remember me saying that I look on Craigslist every day in the free uh, section and I look for people who are offering free trees. Um, last summer, there was a, a guy getting, he uh, was getting rid of a very large tree in his backyard. And I looked at the pictures and it looked kind of like it had burls on it and wasn't quite sure. So I was about a couple miles from the house. It was in Brook Park and I drove over there and it turned out it was. It was just covered with burls. I, I've been doing this roughly since uh, 2010, and I've never seen honey locust burl before, so I thought it was pretty rare. So I, I filled up the trunk of my car that day with, uh, when I went, visited him, and then I went back twice more. One time Steve Cheshire helped me, and we made 20 turning blanks out of the burl, and um, Steve only wanted two. So I got 18 planks and Steve has two. And we worked probably four hours to cut it up with a chainsaw to get the right pieces. So anyways, this is an, uh, the first uh, piece I had. Very pretty figure. You could see the, the burl figure, those uh, stripes going up vertically here. And I left a natural edge on this one, which is very nice with the burl. And I, and I oriented the, the natural edge to be on an angle here. So I thought that came out kind of nice. That's very nice, Mike. Mike, what can you finish on these burls? So these I'm, uh, I wet sand with walnut oil to 400 grit probably. Um, then I, uh, I let it sit for a month. Then I go back and I, uh, I touch it up and then I put a couple of coats of wipe on poly on top. And the walnut oil soaks in and it pops the grain and then the poly on top provides the, the gloss shine which I prefer in many cases, and it also um, um, protects the wood a little bit better. Uh, too much poly in it, you get too thick of a coating, and some people like that, but I just, I like to try to hit it with just a little bit of, of the gloss. All these pieces will be the same coat, uh, same finish. Here's Mike, another piece. Mike, how big was the burl that, that started with? Um, The burl was, uh, the center of the tree was, was regular wood and the burls were growing around it. So the, th the tree itself was three foot diameter and the burl might have been four or five inches uh, rind around, the, around most of the tree, but bumps, like bumps all around it. So the, you know, you cut them out and you try to center the, the, uh, the burl part on the, on the tree and you um, sort of, um, Put the tenon on the in the regular wood and you sort of keep and you try to decide if you want to keep any of the regular wood or just cut it all away and make just the uh, uh, the burl stay stay around so the burl probably five ten six to seven inches diameter not, not not really a diameter but a rind around the regular wood here's another piece this is six inches diameter um, now, a lot of the burl is on the outside of the tree, so you get a lot of, uh, of the uh, cream-colored wood, the sapwood. Again, honey locust is known to have a very 
cherry red heartwood and a yellow cream uh, um, sapwood. I kind of like the, uh, so if you, the, uh, the burl figure here is not as strong, but the bark inclusions are what makes it really. This is probably my favorite here. This is bigger, nine inches high, and the wood just really pops on this one. Hey Mike, with either of these, did you do anything special to hold the outside of the piece to keep it from flying apart when you return? No. Um, I leave the wood a little bit thicker than I would normally do. Maybe um, three eighths even or a quarter, certainly no more than, uh, no less than a quarter. I, uh, sometimes, usually I, I don't go really thin anyways, but a quarter inch is, is quite, quite thin with, with uh, holes that are this big. Yeah. If I, on occasion, I, um, I would wrap uh, cellophane around the outside or tape to hold it just to make sure. But I don't like to do that because I'm always um, stepping back and looking at the contour, making sure I get the contour right. And the tape interferes with my ability to look at the wood and decide if I like it. The curving, uh, the curving of the, from the maximum diameter to the foot, I have to work on that a lot. I frequently make my bases too fat and they don't look right. And so I go back and I cut them skinnier so that the foot is much smaller. Makes it more delicate, more um, graceful in my opinion, but a little bit less um, stable if you were worried, about, if you lived in the earthquake zone. Yeah. This one here, another version. This one here, the uh, opening is primarily natural. And uh, again, eight inch. You can see at the in the left hand picture that the uh, the heartwood showing there. It looks the heart uh, heartwood is again the deep red, and it looks quite nice. And this is another beauty. This one here, ten inch diameter. This one is very thin walled, um, a little bit thicker than an eighth inch, but not much. And um, even though it's an open bowl, I used my hollowing system with the camera to get that uh, nice even wall thickness. Look at the figure in that one, that just pops. Yep. Last one, nine inch diameter. You can see the bark goes all through this thing. And, um, on one side, it looks like it's almost a normal bowl. On the other side, you see it's got the big uh, natural gaps. So this is six pieces. Uh, one more. This one here. Um, this is the sphere that I turned in my uh, sphere turning demonstration in um, a few months ago. So this was, uh, I turned it um, round. And then I hollowed it, uh, and I turned it around on, on the demonstration, and then um, I hollowed it off, off camera, and I let it sit for several months, and it turned a little bit oval. The wood, uh, the burl wood shrunk as it dried differently than the, um, uh, than the heart wood. However, I didn't, I sort of liked it, and I didn't want to put, I could have put it back on the lathe to re it, and I decided not to do it. And instead, I just carved a few, uh, a, a a set of uh, three feet on the bottom to um, to have it stand a little bit off the off the surface of the wood. That came out kind of nice. Um, I also want to point out the picture of the um, of the of the the two lower pictures are were taken with my camera, and the third one, the one showing the feet, um, that's also in the same exact lighting, same exact uh, camera station, photo station that I use, but I use my, uh, my cell phone instead of the camera. And you can see the color balance is off. And no matter how I tweaked it, I couldn't get the color balance to match what I, uh, it's not really the true color. The true color is more like the, the other two pieces. So just a warning that um, um, maybe I need a better cell phone with more options on, on how to uh, 
get the right color balance. Very nice, Mike. Very good. Okay, Reine. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, just a regular old salad bowl. <laughs> Uh, uh, cherry and uh, yeah, it's about 16 inches in diameter and uh, uh, all, all of the, all the dark stuff is pyrographic. It's just done with different wood burner tips. And it's finished with walnut oil. So it's a, it's a food safe one. Do you put any uh, finish on the, on the burnt parts? Yeah, I just do this, whatever I'm doing the rest of the finish with, I just put it on that. What I, what I usually do, I don't like the, I don't like the burn part to be shiny. Uh, I don't like anything to be shiny, really. Uh, so it tends to, it tends to pull up on the, on the burn part. So I just take a, a dry brush, like a, a, a chip brush, you know, that you get at Harbor Freight, the throwaways a bristle brush, I just take that and tamp it down onto the burn part to soak up the, the excess oil, uh, no matter what I put on there. And that works pretty nicely. I just tamp it off and then keep a paper towel handy and just keep the brush somewhat dry on the paper towel. And that makes a nice flat finish on the burn that protects it. This is... Somebody gave me a piece of giant bamboo, which I'd never seen before. And it sat on top of the refrigerator for about five years because I didn't know what the hell to do with it. And uh, it split actually. And that, that, those two pieces, those two vertical pieces that you see, one's a piece of holly and the other's a piece of ebony. Uh, I finally just tapered those and glued those into the split and that worked out pretty nicely. They're, they're actually uneven. I didn't make any effort to keep them flush with the bamboo. And then the rest of it is, uh, what is it? There's maple, uh, uh, I think it's bloodwood and bird's eye maple lid and then the base is walnut and it's lined with a Aluminum cup that'll actually fit a wine bottle if you so choose. <laughs> oh. Or cut flowers. Uh, it was my first experience with bamboo, and it was kind of interesting because you, the, the the bamboo isn't turned at all. That's the piece that came right off the stalk. Uh, but I tried to get a nice finish on it, and I discovered that you don't uh, you don't turn or sand bamboo because it's like the filaments on corn silk on a corn cob, it just starts peeling off in these very fine vertical or parallel filaments. And if you try to do it with sandpaper, any rough sandpaper or anything that tries to take it down, it just turns into a mess. It's like a bundle of fibers. So I think I finally, I, I ended up using a, a nice sharp cabinet scraper to just real lightly uh, go over the surface to get a bit of a, a shiny surface on it and then finished it with oil. Huh. This is a piece of ambrosia maple. I had a plank. Uh, it's a two inch thick plank by about, and it's about 12 inches wide and about six feet long. And it just, it's a, it, it's just a beautiful piece of ambrosia maple. It has just beautiful figure all the way through it. Um, and basically I've made a bunch of these. This, this one I, this one I did, I added a lid to it. And, Unfortunately, the damn lid took, took about twice as long to make as the base. Um, uh, the lid's just made out of, it's made out of blood wood uh, and then burned and there's some, uh, there's some longleaf pine needles that stick out of it uh, at the end of it. Uh, and it's just, uh, it's, the, the inside's just, it, it's, it's, it's not hollowed as you can imagine. It's just a straight cut down. It's just bored out with a half inch drill and then chiseled flat on the, on the side walls with a, with a regular wood chisel. I like that one. How do you stick the needles into the wood? The pine needles? Well, I, t I put a little, probably a, a 16th or 332nd 
uh, drill into my little microcarver, you know, that runs at about 30,000 RPMs and just held the piece of blood wood and tried to go in perpendicular to the, to the edge. Uh, just bored a bunch of holes and then cleaned them out with, uh, with a dental burr. And then they're about, they're about a half an inch deep and then just stick the pine needles in and, and epoxy them or super glue them in. Uh, I did find, I have found that the pine needles are pretty fragile, even if they're short like that, and they'll snap off if you just disturb them a little bit. So I, I, I on this one, I used some, uh, some black epoxy or some black super glue cyanoacrylate. I just kind of soaked the pine needles with that and then wiped it off and brushed it down real lightly with a brass brush and they come out with a nice nice soft finish but they're nice and sturdy it's almost like one piece but they mm -hmm. still look like a group of pine needles this one i just finished it's a great big silver maple burl that i had sitting around wondering what the hell to do with it and i finally got the guts to tackle it because uh, it's quite large and uh, it came out okay. Wow. Sort of like yeah. a helicopter going by. Huh? Yeah, I have a, I, I've, got a, I've got a big old VB36 lathe in my garage that'll handle this kind of stuff. But it's, it, it, more and more it scares the hell out of me. You, you don't want to go past that tool rest <laughs> or something like this because it'll chop your hand off. <laughs> wow. That's nice too. Is that very nice? This one's very, that one's very thick because it, uh, I, I, I didn't want to mess with the, it had these nice bark inclusions and, and uh, you can't tell on this, but I, I like to go into those bark inclusions, occlusions and kind of, enhance them with burning and texturing, you know, because they're nice and three-dimensional. So um, I didn't make this one very thin. I just, I wanted to keep that three-dimensionality of the, of the depression, so. And I got so sick of about three projects that I was working on that were giving me trouble, big projects, I finally caved in and I said, I'm gonna try some hummingbird houses, but I, I decided to put a little buyer caveat on it. Uh, you know, after watching hummingbirds on my porch all summer, uh, hummingbirds do not nest in in cavities. <laughs> and uh, being a first generation immigrant with German parents, I, I, it, it's hard for me still to think of things that are non-functional. So, no, the hummingbird houses are non-functional. But they were they were fun to do because it's the, it's probably the first thing in about five years I've done that only took about an hour or so. Yeah. Mm. So it's kind of a relief. Okay, very nice. Any questions for Ryan before we go on? Oh, okay. Beautiful work. Yeah, beautiful. I I got a, I cheated on those. Those are cut from a dowel. From a oh. two-inch you know, from Home Depot. A piece uh, that has the pine needles in the, in the handle uh, looks like kind of like an Asian influence on that. Yeah, I'm glad to, to hear you say that because that was the intention. <laughs> Very well done. Yeah, it, it, it really, uh, it's a beautiful piece, absolutely. Thanks. I, I'm happy with the way it turned out. I, 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 I got to figure out a faster way to make that handle because it, it sinks down into the, I think you can see on the lower right, it sinks down into the cavity about an inch long, you know, to keep it nice and stable. But uh, it just took a while to do by hand. I, I think I figured out, I've got, a, I've got a CNC router and I think I figured out a way to just put a two inch piece of wood down and cut a whole bunch of these with the router, with the CNC router went from a CAD drawing. So I haven't tried that yet, but hopefully that'll work. Yeah, lately I've been uh, watching some YouTube videos off and on with uh, Asian uh, potters, master potters, and some of the shapes and things that they have, uh, some are quite unique and uh, get a little inspiration, you know, so I've been experimenting and that's why I haven't posted anything because I haven't really uh, finished anything. I got several things in progress, 
but uh, definitely has a, 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 I like that influence. It's a beautiful history. Um, if, you, if you're looking for other stuff, I found that a lot of the modern, a lot of the contemporary basket makers, basket weavers are doing beautiful stuff too, that, that have an oriental influence. And uh, the pine needles come in handy. That I, I just have a whole stack of those that I've got. They're long leaf pine, they're about 10 inches long and they come in, you can get them in all different colors. Uh, uh, and uh, the other thing that the other thing I found is handy for you know doing Asian type things is uh, porcupine quills. Uh, it's a place down in Mansfield called Royal Wood LTD that sells all these weird things for basket weavers, and they sell bags of uh, porcupine quills that are white with a black tip. The only thing is you have to be very careful with them because they have the porcupine barb on them. And if you stick them in your finger, you won't get them out without tugging them out. Oh, geez. <laughs> you, have to, you have to snip the barb off the tip. <laughs> but they're beautiful because they're white. So they're just pure white with a black tip on them. And bundled together, they look great. The pine needles give a nice effect. It's a nice little touch. You know, all the little subtle things that you've done, you know, all blends very well. And it all comes together. Very good, very good. This is a cherry utility bowl that um, I had the wood uh, given to me by uh, Dave Bricker, another uh, North Coast wood turner. Uh, it's had a bunch of uh, uh, trees come down due to uh, storms this summer. And so he's got a stockpile forming of cherry walnut and this is a piece uh, from that that group. Looks very nice. What's your finish on this, Ken? Um, wax, just waxed. Okay. And I these are the first two that I attempted. Uh, they uh, weren't glued together, and no decoration or finish on them yet. Um, but I was trying some different things on the top. Um, I think I used the same thing that uh, he was using for the for uh, decorating the top, but I preferred the lighter kind of finish that uh, came on the uh, on the maple one. So. Yeah, those came out nice. So that's um, that's just walnut on uh, for the lids there. Yes, and they're both textured, but the one is gilding attached to it. Or applied on top. Yeah, it's a wipe on um, uh, gold gild. But the uh, grooving, the, the actual um, grooving into the walnut was a different tool, and I like that work, uh, look a lot better. Yeah. How do you stop the weathering on the inside? You put some kind of uh, solution in there? When you, take, when you take it outside, it has to weather the wood. Now that's the question I have of um, what uh, b would be the best finish because I think even though they won't um, actually house a hummingbird, some people may put them out thinking that they will. So it needs to be a weather, good weather finish. Inside? I didn't do anything with it yet. They're not glued together. So th there's no finish on them yet. But that would be a question I would ask you guys of what would be the best finish to do, to put on them um, if they are gonna be stuck outside for decoration. Like a wipe on poly. Yeah, That's yeah there's, a, there's exterior grade uh, polys, right? They're called spar varnishes sometimes. I guess okay. that, yeah, that's best I can, I can suggest. You might also think about just putting a little drain hole in the bottom of them. <laughs> yeah. Like Mike said, they use spar varnish on decoys that they hunt. It's a marine grade. Water locks makes a really good outdoor finish too. It's just expensive. Okay, thanks. Was that the uh, crown texturing tool that you got? Uh, the one on the left is the Sorby. Um, the one on the right, uh, it's, I bought it from Craft Supply, and I'm not sure the name that they've got uh, on that, but there's two different size wheels. 
Um, but I, I don't know the manufacturer's name. Well, that's fascinating. We got, um, I think that's five different guys who've made uh, hummingbird nests or hummingbird houses this month. So too bad we don't have uh, the turn and learn competition because we would have been in good shape. <laughs> Very nice, Ken. I like the one. I agree. The one with the gilding on it is a nicer, it's a nicer uh, texture. Thank you. Jim. Yes, I'm here. This is just a little uh, maple candy dish. Uh, I had a piece of wood left over you know, in my in my uh, wood pile and. Uh, just made a little candy dish out of it. And I just put a lacquer finish on it and then buffed it up. Okay, very good. Uh, here's a piece that's a maple burl. And as you can see, it's about nine inches by two and a half. Uh, uh, again, it was a, I did this a couple years ago and I think I got lacquer on it and I buffed it all up. And yeah, that's a nice piece of wood. Yes, it is. I love that one. Yeah. Do you use this one or is it just for decoration? Uh, it's uh, decoration right now, really. But you can use them, obviously. And this is a, a little spalted maple. It's a faux coffee pot. Or, yeah, coffee pot. Uh, playing around doing something and uh, I saw somewhere uh, uh, somebody was making coffee pots and said, oh, let me try that. So uh, uh, that's what I came up with. It is hollow inside. The lid does come, or the, right, the lid comes off and it's just a little, little, little piece on it like that. Uh, the uh, spouts and the handle, <clears throat> excuse me, are glued on. They are not turned. Uh, and it's, I think I got lacquer on it. It buffed it out again. That's basically what I do now. So how do you do the lacquer? How many coats? Do you sand in between coats? That kind of stuff. Uh, I probably got uh, two or three, at least two, maybe three coats, and I, I brush it on. Okay. And with a little light sanding between them. And then uh, after it's all good dried up, uh, then I'll uh, buff it out with the wax. Put a little there bit of shine on it. It's kind of nifty. Yeah, now, it's a little different. Just, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a piece of orange alabaster. I, I did uh, four or five of them last, uh, last month uh, in the show and tell. Uh, it's about, uh, you know, what was it? About four and a half, five inches tall, three inches or so at the top. And I put it on a, uh, a bloodwood base. And uh, the lighting doesn't, sh well, the lighting I had makes this look a little more yellowish. It is orange. Uh, it's one of my favorite types of uh, a stone to turn. Uh, hard to come by, but uh, you can find it every now and then. And uh, just to go a little bit more on the turning of an alabaster, you use the same tools. It's a messy process. It's like turning drywall. If you ever sanded any <laughs> drywall, it's very dusty. But uh, once you get past that dusty part, uh, uh, it's fine. Uh, you sand it all up. Uh, I go through the grits, and then from about 600 to 2000, I wet sand it and get a very nice smooth finish on, the, uh, on, on, the, on all the pieces. And, and then I'll put a light coat of uh, basically, I think I've been using, like I said, lacquer, and then I'll buff it out with some wax on it to give a nice little shine. So. Yeah, I like those, those rock ones that you've been doing, those minerals, they're quite, quite nifty. <laughs> Yes, uh, you'll probably remember uh, Max Kremel. Uh, yes. You had a, okay, you had a piece from him. He also wrote a three-part series on how he did his alabaster pieces. And I copied them off, and I had started doing these alabaster pieces, pieces maybe uh, 15, 16 years ago. And I... Uh, uh, got a little piece of alabaster. Now somebody's going to ask me, where do you buy alabaster? 
you can buy anything on eBay. <laughs> uh, I bought a little piece. It happened to be orange. I have I bid on and won, and that became my favorite color to turn. I turned it uh, not exactly the way Max had described how he does his pieces. I had to adapt uh, what I had in in, in in the shop to to work the alabaster, and I've uh, refined that over. Uh, the, the next few pieces I turned to come up with a system that, that was good for me and the equipment that I had. But uh, I got interested in turning the alabaster. And uh, like I said, I've been doing it 15, 16 years. Uh, I was doing the summer art shows about that same time. And uh, this became a, a second piece to, to, to potentially sell, you know, the wood and the alabaster but they're still all the same type of design, bowls, vases, and what have you. So. Very nice. And this is my obligatory <laughs> birdhouse. Very, <laughs> very simple. And I, I made it just like it. It's a walnut top and a maple bottom. Very simple. Uh, as the other gentleman pointed out, uh, uh, hummingbirds do not nest in houses like this, they have an open nest, but other small birds can possibly use these, chickadees, finches, house wrens, something like that, if you want to make it and put it out in your garden or whatever. So uh, birds don't care what the house looks like, they just want a nice, nice place to build their nest. Okay, that's me. Uh, I believe that this wood is uh, apple or crab apple. Somebody gave it to me. Uh, you can see the dimensions are five and a half by two and three quarters. Uh, I saw this design in one of those, those English books and it, it just kind of fascinated me. It was done in black walnut. Next. Okay, this is my duck call. It's the first one I ever really finished. I, I finished a lot of the barrels uh, in the past. Most people buy kits and do that, but I actually did the, uh, the, the tone board here. And uh, this is the first one that came out successful. I made a few that didn't come out so good. It's a little funny getting the right thing in, inside here. Uh, and that's black walnut. And uh, that's not a turkey call, it's a duck call. It's black walnut and, and uh, hard maple here. <laughs> Just another picture of it. I finished it with uh, uh, CA glue on, on the bottom, not on the top though. And uh, just experiment. It was kind of like an ingrown walk, black walnut uh, burl that I got from Myler's. <laughs> okay. You got it handy? I do. Let, let's hear it. <laughs> All right. Not a very good caller, but <laughs> uh, Paul can do. Paul Stubbs, he could probably do that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now these are a couple tur turkey calls. Uh, th th this one here, uh, the one on the right, uh, the darker one, is is done in Kingswood uh, uh, with these uh, a that's uh, a Coca Cola striker. And the one on the left, of course, you can't see it. I think I have a flip on the picture. Is a uh, it's quarter sawn sycamore, which I believe you like, Mike. And uh, there's a crystal uh, striker uh, with a with a glass tone board inside. And, and this one here is a copper uh, striker with also a glass tone board. Next, there you see the quarter sawn sycamore and the copper. Uh, striker there and they work too <laughs> but I don't know I don't know how it calls her easy there okay well thank you next okay now this is uh this is I like this uh pepper mill the best I've uh, uh ever made uh just because I like the wood uh I tried did we did try coloring it with an airbrush and uh we really didn't like it so I just sanded it off and I uh, finished it with uh, three coats of uh, wipe on poly, or yes. And all those other things we saw, those were all done with CA glue. I'm sorry, I, I 
kind of miss it. Okay. That's a nice one. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I, uh, nice truck. So, um, okay. Any questions for Mike? Yeah. All right. I was hoping Pete would show up. He just got a new car, a brand new Jeep. I was going to give him a little um, hassle for naming his cars. But um, anyways, he's not on today. He's probably working still. But uh, anyways, that's supposed to be uh, a joke on him. So anyways, if you see him, congratulate him on his new car. All right, that's it. Again, um, I'm a little bit uh, nervous about holding another meeting um, so soon. Um, so we might skip a month uh, in order to ensure that we get enough um, enough people show, uh, entering uh, uh, items. We had to struggle a little bit to get enough for today, but I thought it worked. In the end, we got enough, and it was nice. Again, a nice, uh, nice touch.